Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Hancock Whitney Corporation's second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, this call may be recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Catherine Mistich, Investor, Investor Relations Manager. You may begin. Thank you, and good afternoon. During today's call, we may make forward-looking statements. We would like to remind everyone to carefully review the safe harbor language that was published with the earnings release and presentation and in the company's most recent 10K and 10Q, including the risks and uncertainties identified therein. You should keep in mind that any forward-looking statements made by Hancock Whitney speak only as of the date on which they were made. As everyone understands, the current economic environment is rapidly evolving and changing. Hancock Whitney's ability to accurately project results or predict the effects of future plans or strategies or predict market or economic developments is inherently limited. We believe that the expectations reflected or implied by any forward-looking statements are based on reasonable assumptions, but are not guarantees of performance or results. And our actual results and performance could differ materially from those set forth in our forward-looking statements. Hancock Whitney undertakes no obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements, and you are cautioned not to place undue reliance on such forward-looking statements. Some of the remarks contain non-GAAP financial measures, you can find reconciliations to the most comparable gap measures in our earnings release and financial tables. The presentation slides included in our 8K are also posted with the conference call webcast link on the Investor Relations website. We will reference some of these slides in today's call. Participating in today's call are John Harrison, President and CEO, Mike Ackery, CFO, and Chris Aluka, Chief Credit Officer. I will now turn the call over to John Harrison. Thank you, Catherine, and thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. We are very pleased with the results from the second quarter, which reflect solid earnings amidst our continued efforts to improve profitability, reposition our balance sheet for this macroeconomic and operating environment, and also growing capital. We hope our investors are pleased to see our first half of 2024 resulting in profitability, capital ratios, dividend and repurchase increases, earnings efficiency, and overall AQ ratios, all among the best in the mid-cap bank space. Net interest income is up this quarter, driven by lower deposit costs and improved earning asset yields in both loans and bonds. Fee income continues to grow and exceed expectations, and expenses remain well controlled. Net charge-offs were down, as was our provision for loan losses, but we still were able to grow reserves. Our balance sheet repositioning continued this quarter as loans contracted slightly but mostly due to a purposeful decrease in SNCC balances of $221 million. Our focus remains on more granular, full-service relationships, and our team produced the volume necessary to nearly offset our more selective credit and mix appetite. As we expected, these more granular credits have contributed to NIM expansion, and we will remain focused on loan pricing in the balance of the year. As promised, we have updated our guidance this quarter, and we now expect loans to be flat to down slightly from 2023. This guidance reflects our goal of thoughtfully reducing large credit-only relationships, including SNICs, while originating more granular loans via relationship wins, all for the purpose of achieving higher loan yields and relationship revenue over time. As expected, our credit quality metrics continue to normalize, but the increase in criticized commercial and non-accrual loans was at a more modest pace this quarter, and we remain at or near the top quartile of our peers. Our loan portfolio is diverse, and we still see no significant weakening in any specific portfolio sectors or geography. We continue to enjoy a solid reserve of 1.43%, up slightly from the prior quarter. Our guidance with respect to the allowance and provision remains unchanged. Deposits were down in the quarter, but mostly due to a net reduction in broker CDs of $195 million. DDAs did continue to decline, but at a much more moderated pace than in recent quarters, and our DDA mix was actually consistent with the prior quarter at 36%. There was normal seasonal runoff in interest-bearing transaction in public fund accounts, 
and we were pleased to experience growth in retail time deposits despite maturity concentrations and no significant changes in our promotional rates during the quarter. Our guidance was updated for deposits, and we now expect deposits will be flat to slightly down compared to 2023. We continue to migrate away from broker deposits, which were nearly $600 million at the end of 2023. During the quarter, we were very pleased to return capital to investors with a 33% increase in our common stock dividend, and we repurchased over 300,000 shares of common stock. Even after returning capital, we had strong growth in all of our capital metrics due to our solid profitability, ending the quarter with a TCE of 8.77% and a common equity tier one ratio of 13 in the quarter. As I mentioned, we updated this quarter to reflect our expectations for the rest of the year. Our near-term expectation is to maintain this forward momentum of repositioning our balance sheet, improving NIM, controlling expenses, and growing fee income. Our efforts to control expenses will allow us to reinvest in the company through hiring additional revenue-generating staff, which should help to inflect the balance sheet back to growth in 2025 and support profitability. Mike will cover the guidance in more detail in his commentary to come. As we look forward to celebrating our 125th year and beyond, we hope investors view HWC more as a journey accomplished with strong profitability, granular revenue sourcing, admirable earnings efficiency, solid capital and ACL reserves, a de-risk loan portfolio, and now sporting a nearly 9% TCE and over 13% tier one ratio. As we celebrate the beginning of our next quarter century, our efforts are on the windshield versus the rearview mirror as we work very hard to grow our balance sheet and value over the strategic planning period. With that, I'll invite Mike to add additional comments. Thanks, John, and good afternoon, everyone. Second quarter's reported net income was $115 million, or $1.31 per share, up $0.07 per share and about $2.9 million higher than last quarter. PPNR at 156 million, or 1.79% of average assets, was up 3.5 million from the prior quarter. Our NIM expanded five basis points to 3.37% and pushed growth in NII. Fees were up nicely and expenses were relatively flat and well controlled. As mentioned, we saw NIM expansion this quarter with NIM of 3.37, again, up five basis points from last quarter. As shown on slide 14 of the investor deck, our NIM performance was driven by higher loan and bond yields, as well as lower deposit costs. Those were partially offset by a less favorable borrowing mix. Our total cost of deposits was down one basis points this quarter to an even 2%. Obviously, it's significant that our total cost of deposits turned over in the second quarter after nearly two years of consecutive quarter-over-quarter increases. We saw $2.2 billion of maturing CDs repriced from around 5.01% to 4.78%, driving down the rate on our time deposit book by about eight basis points. Also contributing to the lower cost of deposits, was a seven basis point drop in the rate paid on public funds. Another driver here was continued stabilization in our DDA mix. The second quarter drop in DDAs was only 160 million, lowest level so far, but the mix actually increased slightly from 36.3% last quarter to 36.5% this quarter. We now believe the DDA mix could stay at or near this level through year-end. As mentioned, our loan yield was higher this quarter and was up eight basis points to 6.24% due to our focus on more granular loans. Bond yields were also up about four basis points to 2.6% due to reinvesting cash flows back into our bond portfolio at higher rates. In the second quarter, we saw 166 million of principal cash flow come off the bond portfolio at 2.59%, and then was reinvested at 5.23%. For the second half of 2024, we have about 411 million of cash flow coming off the bond portfolio at around 2.9% that should get reinvested north of 5%. 
In reviewing our NIM guidance in the second half of 2024, we believe we can achieve modest NIM expansion for the next two quarters despite a flat rate environment and little to no balance sheet growth. Fee income in the second quarter was again strong and was up 2% quarter over quarter. We benefited from higher trust fees as well as an increase in both bank card and ATM fees, as well as higher secondary mortgage income. Investment and annuity fees were down a bit quarter over quarter, but from record high levels. We now expect non-interest income for 2024 will be up between 4 and 5% from 2023's adjusted non-interest income level. Expenses for the company were up 1% this quarter, reflecting continued focus on controlling costs throughout the company. Our guidance has been updated, and we expect to grow expenses between 2 and 3%. This is inclusive of plans to hire additional bankers in the second half of 2024. The favorable change in guidance here is driven by overall lower levels of personnel expense growth, despite adding additional revenue generating staff and lower occupancy and equipment expense growth. Our PPNR guide is for PPNR levels to be down about one to 2% from 2023's adjusted level. That implies modest growth in PPNR in the second half of 2024 compared to the first half. While our overall guidance now assumes zero rate cuts in 2024, we do not believe there's a significant difference between a zero rate cut scenario and one where the Fed cuts rates, say, twice this year. Lastly, a quick comment on capital. As John mentioned, our capital ratios remain remarkably strong, even after returning capital through the dividend increase in share repurchases. All things equal, we expect the share repurchases could continue at a similar pace for the rest of this calendar year. Certainly changes in the growth dynamics of our balance sheet and share valuation could impact that view. I will now turn the call back to John. Thanks, Mike. Let's open the call for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. Your first question comes from Katherine Mueller with KBW. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Katherine. Uh, maybe my first question just on the margin as you think about uh, the, the pace of loan yield increases in the back half of the year. Is, is the change that we saw this quarter a good pace to think about what we'll see over the next couple of quarters, just assuming a flat rate environment? Um, or do you expect some, um, you know, kind of a, a lesser increase in loan yield as we get to the back half of the year? Hey, Catherine, this is Mike. Uh, I'll start off, and John can certainly add color, but in terms of the NIM expansion that we're expecting in the second half of the year, you know, we kind of describe it as modest, and, and I think that means, you know, potentially a couple of basis points in each the third and fourth quarter, and certainly one of the drivers that will push our, our NIM a little bit higher in the second half is higher loan yields. Certainly that comes from a continued repricing of our fixed rate loan portfolio, as we've talked about before, but then also I think from, you know, some incremental improvements in our variable loans going forward as well. We had a little bit of a favorable mix change this past quarter that was very helpful, and assuming that kind of continues, yeah, I would expect to see a couple of basis points improvement in our loan yield, again, in each of the next couple of quarters. Okay, great. And then I was surprised to see the expense um, guidance come down, so improve, because I know you've been talking a lot about hiring in the back half of the year, and I know you, you mentioned that there's some offsets in personnel and occupancy that's perhaps paying for that. Um, but if you could just kind of uh, walk us through some of the things that you're doing to, to um, create those savings, and then is it also fair to assume that maybe the growth rate picks up more in, in 2025 as maybe we get kind of the full impact of hires in the back half of the year? Yeah, Catherine, this is Mike again. I'll get started. And uh, to kind of answer your last question first, yeah, I think as we look at 25, you'll certainly see the annualized impact in 25 of the hires that we make, let's say, in the second half of this year. 
as well as, as well as any new hiring we continue to make in 25. So I do think that we'll have all things equal, you know, a little bit higher level of expense growth in 25 compared to 24. Now related to 24, you know, one of the things I think our company is known for, and, and this is kind of embedded in our culture, is good cost controls and, and really being mindful of how we spend money. And I, I think that what we're doing here is, is really something that just kind of embodies that. So our pledge is that we will continue to find ways um, by controlling costs in the current cost base to be able to pay for new initiatives, including new hires going forward. Um, lots of things going on that kind of make that happen. You know, we've talked about strategic procurement really being institutionalized in our company. And I think as each quarter goes by, we continue to get benefits from those programs. Um, but then we also, you know, have done some things here and there with looking at outsourcing that I think has been incrementally useful, and that's something that, that certainly could pick up as we go forward. Uh, so those are the things that, that I would use as examples. But again, the pledge is to really kind of pay for those new hires by creating room inside of our existing expense base. So, John, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that was good. Okay, that's great. Thank you. you bet. Thank you, Kevin. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Rose with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. Um, just wanted to start on. Um, just wanted to start on the, uh, the the SNCC reduction. I know that's been, you know, one of the things you guys have been working on. Can you just remind us, um, you know, what the target is, you know, by the end of the year over the next couple of years, where you'd ideally like to get to? And I assume that a lot of these loans, or at least the ones that you're going to let run off or, or move move away from you, you know, are lower yielding, and you're replacing them with smaller, higher yielding. Um, loan. So if you can just discuss kind of the interplay on, on how that should play out in the loan yield, because it would seem to me that that would be a positive benefit as we move forward. You could actually see, you know, sustain higher loan yields, you know, versus many of your peers, given that dynamic, even if rates begin to come down. Thanks. Yeah, Michael, this is John. I'll start, and then it, Mike or Chris can add color if they like. Um, uh, I mean, you answered the, the question. The, the goal would be able to de redeploy uh, presuming demand is there into higher yield and, and also opportunities for some self-providing liquidity as well as fee opportunities that you get with uh, smaller full-service full relationships. In terms of, of uh, sizing the rest of the year, um, we did make a lot of progress in second quarter and typically there's a, a lot of maturity action in Q2 each year so it was a bit uh, outsized. We were, and frankly I was very pleased to see the hustle and diligence of the, the core of bankers across several lines of business to replace almost all of it in one quarter. The second half of the year is going to be a bit more modest. Uh, Michael, we, we would suspect somewhere in the neighborhood of about $100 million in additional uh, SNCC outstanding balance reductions in the second half of the year based on what we know now. And then in 2025, not to get too much into 25 guidance, but to answer your question, Probably about the same amount of runoff in uh, in 2025 as in the whole of 2024, and that would take us to somewhere in the neighborhood, all things being equal, of around a nine percent total uh, amount of SNCC uh, outstanding balances as a percent of total loans, which is right on top of uh, of those people that publish the peer normal, and then from there, you know, it'll go wherever the the right answer is. So, you know, once again, the desire there is really to remove any optics. Uh, that would create a hangover in valuation. We're sort of in the business of, of, of uh, doing whatever we can to improve valuation for investors um, now that profitability is uh, at a pretty good place and not really any, any you know, concern over any particular part of the SNCC book. It's just a, manager of, a matter of managing optics down. And frankly, we're really good at a lot of other things and shouldn't have to depend on SNCs for loan growth as much as uh, maybe the last couple of years when we were awash with liquidity. Any redirect on that topic you'd like? I was just going to ask, um, just the uh, at nine percent. Is that is that kind of where you want to be? I, I think you just said that's around where where peers are. Or could we see that you know drift lower over time in the kind of the intermediate to longer term? Well, you know, not not to to focus too much on it, but uh, generally we would like to be in the range of where our peers are, both published and unpublished. And at that point, at this point in time, that's around nine percent. So, 
if uh, uh, if that were to go lower, then we'd go lower. If it goes higher, we'll probably stay about where we are because we think we can generate other types of activity to cover. Okay, understood. Perfect. Um, and then maybe just as my uh, follow up, certainly understand uh, the near term, uh, you know, color on uh, on share repurchases. Um, but you do get, you guys do have pretty robust capital at this point. I know a lot of people are talking about M and A across the industry. If you can just kind of frame up. Um, you know, what you guys would, would potentially be looking for, because it sounds like now you guys are on your, your front foot after doing a lot of work over the past couple of years to, to get where you are and to get the profitability efficiency where it is. What's what's the next step for, for Hancock? Does M&A play a part in that? What would you look for, ideally? Thanks. Yeah, Michael, I'll, I'll get started. And um, thanks for the question. And, 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 yeah, there's certainly been a lot of, you know, fantastic work over the past couple of years in terms of de-risking the loan portfolio, building reserves, building capital, and then pretty dramatically improving profitability, both from an ROA and then an efficiency ratio standpoint. So the last couple of quarters have been, you know, about thinking about ways to proactively manage capital. And so we we had the increase in the common dividend this past quarter, and then again, the resumption of buybacks. And I, I think I said in the uh, opening comments, that kind of going forward, we would expect to, all things equal, kind of continue the buybacks more or less at the current levels, you know, and uh, the, the things that could change that view would be a change in the dynamics related to the growth of our balance sheet and then certainly the dynamics related to our valuation, either higher or lower. So uh, certainly the stock has enjoyed a, a pretty nice couple of days, as many other banks have as well. And uh, that doesn't change, I think, the way we think about the buybacks. I think we'll still, you know, look at engaging in buybacks at more or less the same levels. And, uh, you know, having said that, that's something that gets, you know, evaluated really kind of on a weekly basis as we go through the quarter. Uh, a little bit longer term in terms of the M&A question. Uh, M&A is, is obviously something that we have not been focused on the last couple of years. It's really been on the things that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, and um, you know that doesn't change today. Although we we certainly pay very close attention to the things that are going on in the market, we we listen to the conversations, we talk to people, we get to know people, all the things that I think you would expect a company of our size and, and magnitude to do. In terms of uh, actually participating in M and A, I mean that's probably something a little bit further down the road. We I think we'd like a little bit better valuation. And certainly, I think everyone in the industry would like a little bit better clarity in terms of um, the, the regulatory oversight and what the approval process actually is. You know, maybe there'll be some clarity later this year related to that. We'll see. Uh, but when the time comes, we, we certainly won't shy away from considering growing our company strategically through M&A, whether that's transactions that would um, add scale to the balance sheet and give us an opportunity to take out costs or other transactions that give us an opportunity to uh, be a little bit more strategic and introduce new markets. So um, so that's kind of how we think about that. Great. Thanks for taking my questions. Okay. Right. Thanks, Michael. Your next question comes from the line of Casey Hare with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up on uh, Mike's question on M&A. So um, I guess, w would you say it's like a fairly active, uh, is there a lot of discussion going on right now? And then as a, a follow-up to that, what, you know, is there an asset level that would be uh, ideal for you guys in in uh, pursuing M&A coming from $35 billion? Sure, sure, Casey. So the, the way I would answer that question is, um, you know, certainly a lot of visits from investment bankers, you know, with uh, with books and, and ideas. So that's probably picked up. Fair to say that that's picked up in the last couple of quarters. But in terms of our involvement, I mean, again, as I mentioned, we're doing the things that you would think a company like ourselves would do, and that is just getting to know people and paying attention to the things that are going on, kind of around us. In terms of uh, sizing any kind of opportunities, I think that's, you know, really premature and, and really kind of don't want to go there right now in terms of indicating any kind of size. 
what I did kind of comment on was, you know, transactions that would add scale to the balance sheet and then other transactions that would give us an opportunity to expand strategically. But, you know, there's nothing in mind specifically related to either of those options right now. I think that, you know, if and when we engage in M&A, it's probably, probably a little bit further down the road, let's say. Okay. And it, I guess, is there a level of capital that is, you know, that would change your stance on, you know, maybe getting a little bit more aggressive on buybacks? I mean, looking at slide 19, a year ago, you guys were 140 bips uh, lower, right? So, you know, uh, fast forward a year, if we if we continue that cadence, you know, we could be, you know, north of, you know, approaching 15. So I'm just trying to get a sense, like, the, the capital build's pretty impressive, and, and just trying to get a sense of what, what would change that buyback cadence. Yeah, look, it's a great problem to have, and uh, we don't shy away at all from our ability to grow capital. Uh, we're, we're proud of it, and it, it, we think it's something that certainly is a hallmark of our franchise and our ability to, uh, to grow our company. So the, the guidance that I gave really was for the next couple of quarters in terms of continuing the buybacks at, current, at kind of the current levels. But look, that's something we'll evaluate as we go through the next couple of quarters. And, uh, you know, certainly don't want to commit to anything right now that would be premature. This is John. I'll, I'll add to that. Obviously, the the best purpose of, uh, of using capital is to capitalize a faster-growing balance sheet than we have right now. The, the macro hasn't been friendly to provide that. And so the reason we, we began talking a, a couple of quarters ago about uh, trotting, you know, more offensive players on the field was because we expected that macro environment was going to be the case. So at, at this moment in time, our focus is really more deploying um, our revenue generators in the field, supporting them with maybe a bigger marketing spend, adding players uh, and potentially offices and markets that we believe the leadership's already in place and ready to move and start adding accounts on a net basis uh, at a faster clip. So that's really, I guess, where I'd say our heart and minds are. All the other options that you mentioned before in the questions are all fair, but they're really maybe column part B or C behind uh, uh, inflecting the balance sheet to more northward growth, if that makes sense. So we pay attention to capital levels. Uh, certainly view all those options as possibilities discussed and dutifully with our board members um, and the priorities are exactly what we put in the deck. I hope, I hope that's helpful. It is. Thanks, guys. You bet, Casey. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Brandon King with Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, good evening. Good evening. So in the prepared remarks, you mentioned, you know, keeping the DDA mix potentially stable through year end. So could you just talk about what gives you confidence in that projection if there's any sensitivity to Fed funds? Yeah, th thanks, Brandon. I'll get started with that one, and certainly John can add some color. But um, really what gives us confidence is I think we've, we've, what we've been able to accomplish thus far this year, and that's this notion of stabilization of that mix. So in, in our deck, you know, those are rounded numbers and the mix, both for uh, last quarter and this quarter, we, we advertise at 36%. But, you know, actually, uh, those numbers round the 36%. We actually had a little bit of an increase quarter over quarter in terms of that mix. So the guidance that we're giving for the end of the year is kind of this notion of 35 to 36%. And... You know, we're as confident as we can be that we'll be able to hit those marks, you know, at 1231 of, of 24. So I think to answer your question, the thing that gives us confidence is the stability that we've actually witnessed, uh, as well as, you know, talking to customers and really kind of ascertaining that um, the worst of that remix is certainly behind us, I think. Okay. And, and any sensitivity to the, the rate outlook, does that at play any? factor? No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, our outlook right now has been conservatively reduced to the zero rate hikes. You know, maybe we'll get to, we'll, we'll see uh, at, at this point. You know, we're not betting on that. And uh, should we get a couple of rate cuts, you know, later this year, 
then um, you know that I think would would help add to that stability. But with zero, I don't think our outlook changes. Okay. And, and then just wanted to touch on the increase in commercial credit size. I recognize it's, it's normalizing, um, but could you just characterize what you're seeing? And then also, if you're actually seeing any credits move out of that credit size bucket. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Brandon. It's Chris Luca. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I, what I would say is is that, you know, we're seeing a, a a point where we're seeing a lot less in the way of downgrade activity, which is, I think, what you're seeing in the way of kind of this slower inflow this quarter uh, from prior quarters. Um, not to say that I can anticipate that that's going to continue to to slow down, but I do believe that um, our downgrade activity has uh, diminished quite a bit. Um, you know, we did see some some upgrades in the quarter, not not that many as you can imagine. When you downgrade a credit into special mention or substandard, um, it has to you know season and perform for you know several quarters. Um, and we were operating at such a low level that you know the inflows that we've seen over the past uh, two or three quarters need to season um, and resolve themselves um, before we can justify. Uh, upgrading them or um, or seeing them uh, refinance away from us, and, and then finally, what I'll say is is that you know we're really not seeing any sort of connected connectivity between any of the uh, activity in our criticized loan uh, portfolio. Um, there really isn't any uh, single uh, geography or sector, and I know that's easy to say, but it really is true. I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out if there's anything specific in there um, that would uh, uh, you know, draw my attention to the broader portfolio that those come from, and I don't really see anything specifically. All right. Thanks for taking my questions. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Ben Gerlinger with City. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Hi, Ben. Um, so I'm on the website. Hopefully you guys have a five-month CD at 5% 5 even. Uh, if I recall correctly, it's a little bit lower than the promos that you've had earlier this year. I was kind of just curious, when you look at the cost of the pods, obviously mix is going to be a little bit a part of it, but... When you look at just cost of deposits, you're down linked quarter, which is a positive. Um, and then if mix stays, uh, if, if, uh, excuse me, if, if non interest bearing stays roughly the same on mix, is, is most of the yield driving the margin, or do you think you can get the right hand side of the balance sheet to change as well? Yeah, and uh, th this is Mike. So, um, in terms of our promotional CDs, it, you're right. Our uh, our best rate or highest rate out there is the five percent for either a three or five month maturity. We also have an eight month and an eleven month at four and a quarter. So we have reduced that uh, that uh, that latter rate by fifty basis points. But the five percent has been there for a couple of months now. Now, if you go back to the end of last year. We were at 540 for an eight-month duration. So as we've talked about before, you know we've kind of brought in the duration and been able to kind of reduce the promotional rate. So going forward, you know certainly our ability to reprice maturing CDs in the second half of the year, you know, is certainly a driver of our ability to, in, to continue increasing our NIM. But, uh, but the other things that contribute to that is our ability to reprice our bond book. We kind of talked about that. We have the better part of $411 million of bonds maturing or cash flow coming back to us in the second half of the year at a little bit under 3%, and we'll redeploy that money, obviously, at 5% or better, but then also repricing our fixed-rate loans, as we've kind of talked about in the past. So the things that will drive our NIM expansion in the second half of the year are really the same things that have been driving our expansion, uh, certainly in the second quarter, and to a large degree the first quarter as well. So hopefully that uh, that helped answer your question. Yeah, absolutely, that is helpful. So it's mainly left hand side, but a little bit of stability on the right hand side of the balance sheet also helps. Um, yeah. So when 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 you think about the capital, I know we've kind of beat this horse to death a little bit here, but above 13, I know you talked about potential growth in certain 
areas via revenue producers, and he also said lenders. I know those terms are often interchangeable. Uh, and previously, I remember you guys talked about uh, Texas as an area, an avenue for lending growth. I was curious if hires today would probably help 2025, all is equal, but can we see a ramping pace of hires this year that would help next year, or is this kind of more just 10,000 foot view, continue to hire across the board, you're not really trying to set up a better year, just, just trying to get a sense of hires and what you kind of mean by that by revenue production. So th this is John, I'll start, and uh, if I meander around the, the answer, you can, we feel, feel welcome to redirect me a bit. In terms of hiring, the target types of bankers we're looking for are seasoned individuals in what we refer to as the commercial banking and the business banking space. That's going to be, generally speaking, call it 30, 40 million annual revenues and down, which tend to uh, almost uh, uh, self-fund in the overall relationship, and we've demonstrated a, a good bit of skill and success in developing fee services from that same type of client over time. Um, so the bankers we would add would be generally in that space. We would also add wealth advisors given the, the really impressive success I think we've had the last couple of years. Um, and that may be directed to both small business and retail across our financial centers uh, and across the footprint. So. It's, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag, Ben, in terms of geography because, you know, where we have market share, uh, we'll have a better success of wealth advisors because there's a book uh, to play takeaway ball from other individuals who may have the asset management fee income while we have the core banking. We really want it all. So we may see more wealth advisors uh, in, in the markets where we already have a pretty big slice of the pie. Uh, we may see more bankers in those growth markets where it's a bigger pie and we have a small slice. Um, in terms of office ads, that would be in those uh, book-in markets as well. So um, you're, you're correct that uh, the impact of adding bankers is, uh, is more of a 25 um, balance sheet uh, line item, and the expectation would be that we begin you know, seeing the, the print of a, of a new banker uh, uh, make itself known within 12 months and under a flywheel concept, we begin to see substantial profitability between 18 and 24 months, depending on the segment they're operating in, the market they're in, and their experience level. So, uh, so it's really all about 25 and 26, we're talking about adding bankers. The wealth advisors, on the other hand, tend to, to, uh, uh, to make a difference pretty quickly if they're you know, familiar with those markets. Did I answer where you were headed there? Or did did you need to maybe ask a more detailed question? No, that was great. I'm going to sneak one more in. Um, if you guys think about the share purchase, I know I've covered it a bit. Is it is it valuation driven or is it opportunity relative to growth? And if you think valuation, is it relative to peer or your historical past? Just kind of thinking about the the drivers of pressing the buy button here. Yeah, I think it's a function, Ben, of uh, certainly the uh, the levels of capital that, that we enjoy right now, as well as our ability to, to grow that capital, but it's also a valuation question. Uh, we, we look at, uh, you know, price to tangible book value and, and certainly the, our PE ratio, and we compare our valuation to, let's say, the mid-cap peer group. And... Um, you know, certainly there's room for our valuation to improve, and, and one way that we can kind of tangibly show the market that that we believe in our company is to repurchase shares. There's also certainly an opportunistic aspect of this, as you would expect. So I think it's in part all of those things I just mentioned that you you kind of pointed out. Ben, this is John. The only thing I'll add to, to Mike's uh, great comments were. You know, we tend to look at the combination of divvies and repurchases as return of capital to investors. And when we compare ourselves to mid-cap peers, you know, some are lighter or heavier in divvy, some are lighter and heavier in repurchase, but we generally want to be at the capital levels we're at right now and the balance sheet not growing quite as quickly as we'd like it to, um, uh, assure that we're, you know, competing, I think, for investor interest at a similar level of return of capital. So it, it may be more of an art than a science, but all of those things Mike mentioned what I added are kind of the way we look at it right now. Gotcha. That's helpful, Cole. I appreciate your time, guys.
You bet. Thanks for the questions. Your next question comes from the line of Brett Rabbiton with Hovde Group. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Wanted to ask a question on the fee income guidance for the back half of the year. And if I think about the high end of the guidance, that would basically be kind of flattish from the second quarter. But if you look at the trend the past year, you, you've, you know, you had decent growth, particularly in the back half of 23. Um, can we go back to the fee income guide and just maybe is there anything that might be restraining fee income or, or any line items that might be softer in the back half? Yeah, I'll take a pass at that. This is John. Um, you know, the big wild card, I say big wild card, I mean, the rate environment matters when, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the portfolio success matters when it comes to wealth related fee income. So it's, it's hard to gauge you know, what that really will be. But after four or five quarters in a row of record um, annuity uh, and uh, wealth income in general, um, we, we try not to get so overly exuberant that we forecast you know, net quarter over quarter increases at what has been a record pace. So we have that moderated a little bit, not, not, not the fee income itself, but the growth of it. Um, uh, secondly, secondary mortgage fees, now that we're at about a 95% um, uh, percentage of the total deals actually going to the secondary market, that fee income category was up sharply in the first cat, uh, quarter, and it was up again um, a little more modest, but still up uh, enough to make a difference in the second quarter. And depending on what happens with the rate environment in the back half of the year, that one may very well prove to be stronger than we have estimated uh, as part of that guide. We, we, we try to be relatively conservative in the guide, and I think we're assuming a flat rate environment. That would obviously have an impact on secondary fee income. If rates go down, um, then our guide may prove to be a little short when it comes to uh, the mortgage side. Um, all things card continue to perform, and deposit service charges have been stable, and we expect it to remain so for the rest of the year, and the only category that we see uh, continuing to set a record every quarter is SBA, which uh, the second quarter again proved to be a terrific quarter, and I think third quarter is going to be even better. So it's really a mix of what I'll call stable fee income sources and those that continue to grow, uh, but we, we don't want to, to, to try to get, I guess, so I don't want to get irrationally exuberant about the first half of the year being so strong and presume that those continued increases are at that pace. We need a little luck in the market uh, to continue at that kind of a rate. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, no, that was that was perfect and uh, very good color, John. I appreciate it. Um, the other question I, I wanted to ask was, you know, obviously you would have grown the loan book, um, you know, absent the, the reduction in the, the shared national credit portfolio. I wanted just to hear, uh, if, if you gave it, I, I missed it, but just any color on, you know, what you're seeing change with loan demands, you know, here in the past quarter, if it's, if it's, you know, I, I think going back to Gulf South, it sounded like things were softening a little bit from a demand perspective. So I was just curious for an update on demand and just, you know, what you were seeing customers think about for the back half. Sure, Brett. This is John. I'll start again and the other guys can add color if they like. Um, uh, I wouldn't say the tone has changed dramatically since the last time we visited at, at Gulf South. What I, what I can share is it's really a mixed signal sort of a moment in time where uh, using second quarter as a basis, so my, we've already talked about the SNCC runoff, and that wasn't demand. That was just our, our screening appetite is obviously a bit more narrow to achieve the goal that we talked about in the first, uh, uh, first question of the day. Uh, but generally, our, our CRE book, as an example, we had the best production in CRE in the second quarter as we've had in the last six quarters. And in today's environment, when I say CRE, aside from owner-occupied, that really means primarily multifamily with a little industrial and maybe a smaller section of retail in there. There's not any office to speak of, obviously, uh, at this moment in time. But we had a great CRE quarter, and the team uh, did magnificently. The, the outlook and the... Um, the, the uh, uh, pipeline for CRA is also up for the, uh, uh, for, uh, the second half of the year. That said, uh, we are seeing competitors who have been sidelined for fear who have much higher CRE concentrations than we have. Uh, we've enjoyed that advantage you know, for a while, and now we're seeing some players come off the sidelines that have been sidelined to become more competitive, which puts pressure 
on uh, on the the deal prices, and you know we've got to make sure and be comfortable that we're getting the yields that that uh, that need to be there for the business to make sense. Versus look at other types of lending. So CRE um, had a good quarter. Equipment Finance had a very good quarter. Um, pipeline there still looks good. Um, the offsets uh, would be uh, other than the SNCC thing. Um, consumer and home equity line is still really light, uh, both in pipeline and in uh, production. Is not bad. But, you know, we've got to do a fair number of new deals just to stand still, given the amortization levels every quarter. And uh, their higher for longer environment has not been kind to grow in uh, consumer purpose balance sheet. So those are sort of the mixes. There's not really a, a huge difference uh, uh, geographically. I think all of our footprint uh, is, is doing well. And, uh, and, and frankly, given the tepid demand, I'm real proud of our team uh, for doing as much as they did in Q2 to offset the SNCC. Uh, uh, runoff that already happened, and hopefully in the back half of the year, the green shoots I mentioned earlier in some of those categories uh, will sprout, and and maybe our guidance be proven to be a little conservative. But right now, um, we're we're calling it flat. You know, toward the end of the year, maybe uh, slightly down, just depending on what the rate of payoffs are, and uh, and sentiment improving as things develop politically and other types of things in the back half of the year. Okay. Great. That was very helpful. Thanks so much, John. Okay, you bet, Brett. Thanks for the good questions. Your next question comes from the line of Stephen Scouten with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, guys. Good afternoon. Um, I guess on the lumber front, one thing I thought was interesting was just the comment about line utilization ticking up a little bit. Um, do you think we could see a longer term trend there? Accessibility to overall credit is maybe less in this environment, or how do you think about that line utilization dynamic moving forward? That's a great question. We, you know, we talk about it internally a good bit. Um, uh, you would you would think at this point in time on the consumer side, as cards have gotten a lot harder to obtain, uh, we, we're not really much of a card bank, so. It's not a big play for us, but others who have a much bigger basis in cards have certainly screened credit tighter. Um, but it really hasn't led to utilization being heavier. And the only way you know we can really look at that is that the appetite for consumers to purchase big things that they typically put on lines of credit, mostly home equity lines secured or home equity, home equity secured, that their appetite for purchasing is diminished enough to where uh, they're really just kind of amortizing with the level that they're at right now. So uh, uh, so we're not seeing much on the consumer side in terms of utilization increase. Our small business lines of credit, however, uh, have begun to improve a bit. Um, and I think that's because they're getting ready for what they think is going to be a busier half of uh, 2024. And then finally, on the commercial lines, and particularly the C&D lines, um, as, as the drag on our C&D business from mortgages migrating from C&D to the mortgage category uh, greatly diminishes in the second half of this year. Um, that drag on C and D may begin to to allow the category to grow a little bit more. And uh, when we get new deals through the C and D pipeline, remember they start out as zero utilization, and they work their way forward. So as the percentage of deals go up in C and D, the actual line utilization reported goes down. If you follow me, the way the inverse reporting happens, and then as they get more yep. mature and are ready to go into permanent, then the utilization goes up until they pay down uh, into either permanent or going somewhere else for longer term financing. So I, th I think the answer to your question is slight to up line utilization is what we anticipate over time. I don't think it'll be sharply up or down though based on any particular you know piece of news. Okay, makes sense. And then one other thing I've found interesting, kind of these new fixed rate loan yields that you guys disclose on slide 15, um, have obviously trended down the last couple of quarters, and it looks like maybe you've done a slightly higher percentage of fixed rate loans as a percentage of overall production. So I guess I'm wondering, is that intentional to some degree to try to book a little bit more in fixed rate loans as we presumably move towards rate cuts here in the back half of the year or 25? Or is that just more a dynamic of, of demand and just kind of happenstance? I think it's, it's just mix of what we booked that quarter and and the fact that it, it fixed rate lending is a little bit more competitive because of the reemergence of uh, of competitors who really didn't care too much about fixed in the past few quarters, and now they do. So it's and at the at the quality of the credits we're trying to book, uh, Stephen, you know, it, it is pretty competitive. It's not competitive at the low quality, but it's very competitive at the high quality. 
makes sense. Okay. And then just last thing for me, as you think about the, the ability to bring in new hires, I mean, that's something we're hearing from a lot of banks these days in terms of that's, that's how they want to grow if they can. It seems like there would be a lot of demand for good people. What is it that you think kind of gives you the ability to bring those people on? And maybe do you think you're kind of in that sweet spot from an asset size perspective that um, that lenders want to be a part of, or is it just your stability and ability to grow in this environment? Or you know, can you give any color to what you think will drive your ability to bring those people on versus your other peers? That's just a great question. And and when I when I talk to candidates, and and every now and then I actually get the opportunity to do that, um, the selling points that I deliver for them is it's a company that's going to be here. Um, uh, we have achieved a great deal of heavy lifting to the point that co the company is very stable, very profitable. We have capital to deploy to grow the balance sheet. Uh, we've saved an awful lot of money to become more efficient from an earnings perspective where we're not afraid to invest in high-quality people, to add offices, and to invest more in marketing dollars over time. And so um, uh, I think that's attractive. Uh, secondly, the parity we have between our credit team and our banker team is very good. Um, it's a very constructive. Uh, while they don't always see eye to eye on every single credit, it's a very constructive uh, and instructive environment to where they work together. And we try very hard to make sure we're very clear of what we are interested in adding or not adding um, at any given level of segment or geographic concentration. And then thirdly, uh, I think we're very honest with our team members about where the company is headed and what our activity and investment structure is going to look like in the near term. So it's somewhat predictable. So a lot of the tough lifting that we did to trim expenses, to right size office levels, all that, all that sort of in the work environment uh, has already been somewhat completed. And so the direction forward is a little bit more predictable for people who are interested in coming out of an organization that may have a lot more uh, uh, types of uh, unexpected activity coming at them. So we're, we're like when my comment earlier in the prepared area, I mentioned you know we're focused on the windshield versus the rearview mirror, and 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 part of that is directed at that that uh, type of posture. Yeah. Okay. That's those are great insights. Appreciate all the color and thanks for the time. You bet. Thanks for the question. Your next question comes from the line of Gary Tenner with D. A. Davidson. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon, guys. Um, two questions. First, on the CD side, Mike, you update us the amount of CDs maturing third quarter, fourth quarter, along with the prevailing uh, rates on this? Sure. Uh, so in the third quarter, we have about $2.3 billion of CDs maturing. Those are coming off at a little bit over 5%, and we think that those will reprice somewhere in the 465 or so range. So that's a uh, favorable repricing dynamic of about 39 basis points. And in the fourth quarter, uh, the level of maturing CDs dips a little bit, goes down to about 1.9 billion. Those are coming off at 483, and again, we think those will go back on at somewhere around 470 to 475. Um, so those are the dynamics in the second half of the year. And uh, in the second quarter, we had 2.2 billion maturing. Those came off at 5%, went back on at about 478. So certainly. You know, an opportunity for us to reprice that's those maturing CDs a bit lower going forward. Uh, the assumptions that I gave you around the rate that we think those CDs will go back on assume zero rate cuts uh, in the second half of the year. Certainly, if we get a rate cut or two, you know, that improves the dynamics related to uh, those numbers being a little bit more favorable. Great, I appreciate it. And then, second question. Uh, John, you've mentioned in the past, and I think on this call as well, that you know the the outlook for loan growth had kind of shifted from maybe being generated by lower rates to putting more offense on the field, as you as you've said before. Uh, the decline or lowering of your loan growth outlook for the full year. I mean, should we read anything into that in terms of kind of the timing or pace of hiring that you've been able to accomplish, or that your pipeline looks like it's going to? you know, of hires is going to support, or are there other, is, is it more about just overall demand? It's really more a flip to uh, all of our guidance being tied to a flat rate environment. Uh, Gary, if you remember, we had, you know, we had expected to have uh, a few more rate cuts in the back half of the year than we now expect, and 
to make things very simple, we're trying to give all of our guidance, I mean, all of our guidance around fee income, growth, uh, expense load, and everything else to a flat rate environment. To the extent that rates come down a bit, um, then that obviously gives us a little better shot in terms of growing the balance sheet more than we anticipate at the moment. Okay, great. I appreciate that, John. And actually, Mike, if I go back to the CD question one more time, why would the repricing in the fourth quarter, why do you assume that those maturing CDs reprice higher? What's the, the then, then your third quarter repricing? What's the dynamic there? The dynamic of the maturing bucket. So it's just a little bit different mix in the fourth quarter in terms of uh, where they're coming off and then the potential to reprice. So... Um, you know, it's a five or six basis point difference, so it, it's it's not significant. But you know, the driver would be the mix of the maturing buckets. Okay, thanks very much. You bet. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Only with Stephen. Please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks for all the good commentary this afternoon. Um, just want to go back to the funding strategy uh, that we saw in the second quarter and the outlook the back half of the year. Mike, I think you mentioned that the bank leaned heavier on the borrowings in 2Q. Just any more color on kind of what drove that, and then I guess thoughts on the borrowings the back half of the year. Well, I think the driver in the, in the second quarter that resulted in a little bit heavier load of borrowings really were related to the uh, maturing uh, broker CD. So we offloaded half of what was on the books at that time at the end of the quarter you know, we're down to about 200 million. But then I, I think also one of the things that drove that little bit higher level of borrowings was uh, probably a little bit heavier tax outflows that impacted DDAs and to a little bit lesser degree interest-bearing transaction. And then also probably a little bit heavier outflow of public fund CDs. So we view most of those things as really kind of seasonal impacts that impacted the second quarter that, that should kind of right-size themselves as we go through the balance of the year. <clears throat> okay, appreciate that. And then in the absence of, of loan growth and potential loan balance contraction, any appetite to grow the securities portfolio in the, in the back half of the year? Not at this point. The, the view related to the bond portfolio is to keep it kind of flat at current levels. But, uh, but certainly as we go through the, the, the balance of the year and loan growth, you know, is different than our expectations and maybe deposit growth is, is a little bit better, you know, we'll evaluate what to do with that, those excess funds should we have them at that point. Um, you know, certainly the, um, the level of um, rates at that time, I, I think will play into that decision and what we can earn at the Fed versus what we might earn by deploying into the bond book. Okay. Yeah, Matt, this, this is this is John. The only thing I'll add to that is uh, just one interesting dynamic is the mortgage portfolio. We expect to flip into contraction in Q3. That's about a $40 million a month amortization level um, uh, coming off today at 377. So, uh, uh, you know, certainly wherever that goes is beneficial, you know, not only to income but to NIM. And so uh, if we don't see any growth at all, and loans, then uh, you know you, you hate to just let it sit overnight at the at the Fed. But frankly, the, uh, the improvement over 377 isn't bad there either, right? So, um, so that may play into what happens with the bond portfolio modestly. But right now, the, in, the intent is to keep it the same. Okay. Thanks for the color. You bet. Thank you for the question. Your next question comes from the line of Christopher Marionek with Jamie Montgomery Scott. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Good evening. Uh, just a quick credit question for Chris. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, criticized loans get upgraded? Uh, if you see any of that pending the next couple quarters, and just kind of wanted to review the process as time passes. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, obviously there are many different ways that we try to uh, um, manage that segment of the portfolio. One is if we um, don't see, uh, you know, long-term prospects of any sort of improvement, we'll certainly encourage the, the customer to seek uh, alternate financing, um, oftentimes with uh, non-bank lenders, things like that. Um, outside of that, 
you know, typically what we're doing is, you know, we're staying close to the customer, we're understanding their issues, you know, there is obviously a, a, a close relationship in many instances between the relationship manager and, uh, and the client. And we kind of understand, um, you know, what, what their issues are. And as um, the company shows, uh, you know, resolution of whatever issue it was that resulted in them going into a criticized category, um, we typically will um, either wait for the financials to support uh, a change if it's a financial issue um, or if it's a, an event issue to ensure that the event um, has been resolved or is no longer of a significant enough nature to uh, keep it in that criticized loan category. Chris, okay, this, great. This That's John. In, in, you know, in case you were thinking more about timing there, um, Chris mentioned earlier you'd like to see two or three quarters of, uh, of seasoning once whatever the original offending problem was that caused the downgrade. You'd like to see it a couple, three quarters healed before you do the upgrade. So once something gets in that category, it, it's going to linger there for a couple, three quarters, even if it's immediately rectified. And to use a simple example, I know we're at the tail end of an hour-long call, so I'll make it brief, but um, if a client uh, got stretched a bit or leveraged during the pandemic uh, and created an expense load that their revenue just couldn't keep up with and then we get into a higher rate environment, they might need time to trim their expense loads back down to the point that uh, if they had a covenant breach, they've cleared that up and a couple, three quarters later, then you know we feel like we have the justification to presume that problem is solved. So it, it, they linger a bit, but you know obviously we work hard to monitor them and assist where we can to get them to a, to a better place, whether that's with us or, or maybe somewhere else. Hopefully that, that answered what you were looking for. No, that's great. I, I, uh, thank you both for that. And just a quick follow-up, just to, you know, as you allocate reserves, do you see the need to put any more allocations towards commercial real estate or you know, just related to some of the maturities that may be coming uh, future quarters? Yeah, so I'll take a, a quick run at it, and then if uh, Mike wants to um, uh, enhance whatever I say, um, uh, happy for him to do so. Um, you know, we do uh, segment our uh, portfolio uh, based on, um, you know, both uh, a little bit of geography and also on portfolio. And so we do allocate more towards commercial real estate in this current environment, um, and it's expected um, that we would do so. Um, when you get down to kind of sub-portfolios, um, we tend to not allocate down further than that, although there are certain influencing factors within those sub-portfolios that may influence us uh, increasing or decreasing the reserve related to that sub-portfolio. So, um, you know, we do uh, at this point in time have uh, a higher reserve level uh, relative to our commercial real estate book than we did in the past, for instance, um, and that's obviously in recognition of kind of the current environment and the forward view. Uh, that said, you know, I would say, you know, we are fortunate that our commercial real estate portfolio is holding up nicely, and um, we don't really feel like um, there's a need to increase our reserve on commercial real estate uh, for any uh, known issues. No, nothing to add. Thanks, Chris. Perfect. Thank you all. I appreciate the information. That concludes our question and answer session, and I will now turn the call over to John Hairston for closing remarks. Thank you, Krista, for moderating the call, and uh, thanks to everyone for your interest in the bank. Have a terrific evening after a really terrific trading day. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation, and you may now disconnect.